morning, guys. If you got your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Let's open in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we give you thanks, Lord, again, for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord. We thank you, uh, Father, that you've not left us to try to figure things out, that you've given us your word, Lord, that we might study, we might read, we might put into practice, Father. I pray for what I prepared, Lord, this morning would be of you and that you would speak through me, Lord, and that you would speak to each one of our hearts, Lord, and encourage us, Lord, in the teaching of your word. We uh, Pray that you be with Steve and Lori as, as they're on vacation, Lord, this morning, leaving for vacation, and that you would just give them a nice week and a half of just rest and relaxation, Father, that you would rejuvenate Steve, Lord, and that he would, be, he would come back here, Lord, motivated, Father, to do the things that you've caused him to do and that you called him to do, Father. We ask you to be with us, Lord, now this morning. Take the word that I speak, Lord, and put it into our hearts and minds, Lord, that we might be changed more into the image of Christ. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to be very honest with you guys, I've struggled with this message. I've, I've had this message on, down on a piece of paper probably for about two to two and a half weeks, and I was back and forth, you know, if I want, what I, uh, sharing this message, um, even up, to, up until yesterday, I was wondering, you know, Lord, is this something that, that we need to hear? And I felt like the Lord just kept giving me reassurance that this is what he wants us to uh, to talk about. So uh, what I want to talk about is simply I've titled today's, this morning's message, Do We Believe in Hell? Do we believe in hell? I'm going to read something real quick. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the ministry. It's called Got Questions. If you type in like a, like, you know, you can type in something like, you know, the gospel, Got Questions, and it'll pull up. They have a lot of great articles. I spend a good bit of time on that ministry's website uh, just kind of reading some of the things that they say. This is what Got Questions has to say about this topic. <clears throat> they say, many people are uncomfortable to say the least, with the idea of an eternal hell. This discomfort, though, is often the result of incomplete understanding of three things, the nature of God, the nature of man, and the nature of sin. As fallen, sinful human beings, the nature of God is a difficult concept for us to grasp. We tend to see God as a kind, merciful being whose love for us overrides and overshadows all his other attributes. Of course, God is loving, kind, and merciful, but he is first and foremost a holy and righteous God. So holy is he that he cannot tolerate sin. He is a God whose anger burns against the wicked and disobedient. And then they list a couple Bible verses out of Isaiah and Hosea and Zechariah. Goes on and says, he is not only a loving God, he is love itself. But the Bible also tells us that he hates all manner of sin. And while he is merciful, there are limits to his mercy. And then the God questions concludes this paragraph with Isaiah chapter 55, 6 through 7, that says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon the question that you could ask, that I'm asking you guys this morning was, when's the last time, when's the last time that you spoke to somebody about hell? When's the last time you spoke to somebody about hell? I mean, based off what, you know, Got Questions has to say there, hell is, is a sobering. I think it's uncomfortable to talk about a place where people are going to go uh, and, and spend eternity. And I think that's one of the most sobering the things about the topic of hell, that it's eternal, that it's forever. In the same way that we're going to be enjoying <clears throat> just the pleasures of heaven with Christ one day, uh, that there's going to be agony for those that don't know the Lord. And I was reading a couple different quotes from some people. There's a guy named J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle once said, According to the men of the world, few go to hell, but according to the Bible, few go to heaven. 
You know, if you, if you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you look at some of the things that the Bible talks about, it, it talks a good bit about hell. As I was doing some research for this, for this message and I was reading it, so I came across some, somewhere where it said that uh, the, the topic of hell is mentioned 167 times in the Bible. The topic of hell is mentioned 167 times in the Bible. So that tells us that it's an important uh, top topic. I want to read another uh, real quick uh, paragraph out of Got Questions article, and then we're going to get going in this message this morning. Got Questions also says, Many things in life have good news and bad news associated with them. The entire truth is generally found in a combination of both. Emphasizing one side to the exclusion of the other is not the whole truth. The same is true of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, for us to understand how great the good news is, the message of Christ, we have to understand how horrible the bad news is. And that's what drives us um, to Christ. I mean, if you consider the life of Paul, uh, that's what Paul was known for. He, he, you know, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, he talks about the love of Christ compelling him outward so that he would uh, just be able to share the gospel with people and, and see people come to get saved, and then he would disciple them. There's a place in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27 uh, that Luke gives us um, about Paul. He is, uh, he is moving towards Jerusalem. He, uh, he calls for the Ephesian elders, the leadership of the church at Ephesus, to come. And so he had some things to, to say to him. And one of the things that, that he says there in Acts 20, 27, he says this, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Basically what he was saying was that, that he, gave every, he gave all he had from Genesis to Revelation, so to speak. He did, didn't have the New Testament, but some of the writings that he would have given them, he gave them the whole counsel of God. And one of the things that he would have talked about is the, the truth about hell. You know, as I was talking to Trace this week, I think she was talking to Rachel a little bit too, I asked her the question, I said, have you in the eight years that I've been here uh, and preached to the church, have I ever preached a message about hell? I don't think I ever have. I'm not a kind of hell and brimstone type of preacher, but as I was putting this together, I, like I said, I kept getting reassurances from the Lord that this is something that he wants us uh, to talk about. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to open to Luke 16. We're going to we're going to look at, a sto- and I believe this is a story. Some people think this is a parable. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's a parable. I think it's an actual story that Jesus is talking about. Because many times when he would teach by parable, he would say that he's actually teaching by parables. And so I think this is a story um, about two guys. And there's a lot of, and we're not going to dig deep down into this section in Luke chapter 16. We're just going to look, let, let us kind of speak for itself. And then we'll springboard um, out of uh, Luke 16, 19 through 31 into some other places. So starting in verse 19 says this. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf that's fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there there pass to to us. Then he said, I beg you, Therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that uh, he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes uh, to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be uh, persuaded though one rise from the dead. 
You know, that's a sobering section of Scripture right there that, uh, that Luke gives us talking about this reality of hell, this reality where the rich man uh, ended up. Like I said, I'm not going to dig down too much into it this morning. I want go, to go to a couple other places. But what is, some, what is something that sticks out to you uh, in that reading of that section of Scripture? Uh, actually, that's what, one of the things I think that I've, that I've highlighted, too, as I was reading down through this. You, like, like what Mike just said, that we don't get the sense um, in this story that Lazarus th- th- was trying to plead his case and how he was innocent. He didn't say, well, wait a second, I, I don't deserve this place. What, what, what you see here is I think that you see a, settled, a settledness about him. He's settled, he's, he has settled in his destination or, or where he's at. And he, has, he, doesn't, he doesn't come against Abraham or against say something to uh, Lazarus about his condition. He, I, I mean, like what Mike said, I believe that he, he, he knew um, that this was a, where he was supposed to be. What's some other things that stand out in this section to you guys? Yeah. I think what she said is actually really good. If you noticed in that section there uh, where it talks about where uh, Abraham says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Basically what he is saying is like kind of what Rhonda was saying is that they had the truth there for them to, to read. They just didn't do it. It's the same thing, you know, as we would apply these sections of these verses uh, to us today is that People are, I mean, Romans, uh, I think it's Romans 1 tells us that people are without excuse, that they, that everybody knows something about God. I heard somebody this past week that I was watching a, a teaching that says that everybody knows about God if they want to admit it or not. And I believe that's what Romans 1 talks about. It talks about uh, that folks are without excuse. They know that God exists. They just suppress him in wickedness and the things that they're doing. And so I think, well, like with what Rhonda was just saying there is that, that's all that we need is faith, trusting in who God's, when what God said and who God is. As I was considering uh, this Luke 16 uh, the passage, I was thinking about a couple places in Romans. Who here has ever heard of the Romans Road? Most people probably heard of the Romans Road. Basically what it is, it's, it's where somebody has taken a number of verses out of the book of Romans and used them to basically evangelize or, or to tell a message of the, of the gospel. And so there's a couple verses there in Romans I want to read this morning. The first one's in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We'll get to the latter portion of Romans 6.23, the good news closer to the end of the message. Uh, But for the wages of sin is death. So the payment that is due us for sinning is death. In Romans 5.12 it says, "When, when Adam's sin, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. What kind of death is Paul talking about? Mike says the second death. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. In Revelation, it talks about the second death. Matter of fact, um, in Revelation 21.8, um, we're told this. He says, the cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. It's the second death. The reality is we've, we're all going to experience the first death. My, outside of, of us being raptured to, to, to heaven one day with the Lord, every single one of us is going to, we're going to taste that first death, the physical death that all people have to die. And that's, and that's evident, it's really evidencing 
uh, what uh, the Bible talks about whenever sin came into the world, so death came into sin. But the, the one that's, that's the most important death is the second death. It's the second time uh, whenever somebody dies. That's basically their soul or their spirit kind of being separated from God. That they're, they're, they're going to spend, like what we looked at here as, as the rich man in Luke 16, will spend his time uh, in, in hell. Uh, Ezekiel 18.20 says this uh, about those that die. He says, the soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. So that kind of goes with Romans 3.23 when we see here that everyone has sinned and that everybody deserves uh, death. Now I want to read this section in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Hebrews 9.27 talks about that it's appointed unto man once to die and then after this judgment. What, how many judgments are there, do you guys know? Do you know how many judgments we have? Two, I heard two. Two judgments. We have the great white throne judgment, which I'm going to read here in Revelation 20. But we also have uh, the judgment seat of Christ, which is 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 14. Uh, but talks about that's the, that's the judgment that the believers will go to. It's the, called the Bema seat judgment. That we'll stand before the Lord to receive rewards for what we've done in our body, either good or bad. But the sobering one, and this is the one that really, as I was considering uh, this message this morning, this section really was gripping my heart uh, because this is the reality for the majority of people that end up separated from God, like the rich man. That, that they, they were doing their own, all, whatever they wanted to do during their lifetime, and whenever death came, they got taken uh, off guard by it. But in Revelation 20, starting in verse 11, it says this, And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, the earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and the death and, and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The, the lake of fire is the second death. So there uh, we're, we're, we see this again, this idea of the second death. And anyone whose name not, was not found recorded uh, in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, that's a sobering I mean, giving of what it's going to be like for most people. The reality is if you, when you study the Bible, and, uh, like I agree with what that, that quote that I quoted this morning from um, uh, J.C. Ryle where he talks about that, that many people in, in the world, they, they have no concept of heaven and hell. They think it's kind of everybody's going that way. Who's ever watched any of Ray Comfort's um, apologetics videos, witnessing videos on the Internet? Um, if, you guys, if you guys like to, to look at stuff on YouTube, um, I, I spent a little bit of time this week uh, looking at this guy named Ray Comfort who goes and he, he's down in Huntington Beach and different places in California where he is taking people kind of through the Romans road, t taking them uh, to show them their need for Christ. And when he asks the question about, you know, when you die, are you going to heaven and hell? It's like 99% of the people say they're going to heaven. 99, I would say probably close to 99% of the people. There's, there, there's rarely anybody that, that at the first, whenever he asks the first time, that they'll actually say that they're, that they're going to heaven. Then he takes them through some things as he shows them what, 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 Paul, what God's word says, what Paul says about sin, about death, about the second death. Um, by the time that he, he gets done to the end of their conversation, which usually lasts about 10 or 11 minutes, um, they realize that according to God's standards, they're not going to heaven. And so when we look at this section here in Revelation chapter 20, the majority of the people that we meet every day, um, is, is go, they're, they're en route to hell. Why do you think that's important for us to know? That the majority of the people that we bump into every day, be it at work or school or the marketplace, wherever we might find ourselves, what's that? They need to hear the truth. They need to hear the truth. You know, <clears throat> most of you guys know that I've been, I've been working in the jail for the, since January as the chaplain there. And one of the things that I do is I do Bible studies usually every day uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. That's just kind of a block, that I've, or a block of time that I've set aside to, to teach the Bible. And whenever I, as a matter of fact, it's, it's probably about a month ago, I had the, I had the, the, the ladies block. The women were down in the, in the Bible study. And I asked them the question. I said, who are... Who here is born again? 
who here is born again? And I think we, I probably had about 12 or 15 uh, ladies that were in there. And I think a co- if I remember right, I think a couple of them raised their hands, but everybody else kept their hand down. And I let a couple of minutes go by just for, for them to think about that more. And then one of the ladies said, well, what's it mean to be born again? And there's, there's another lady that was in there that I believe is a believer. She said, if you don't know what being born again is, you're not. Do, do, would you agree with that? If you don't understand what it means, who here knows what it means to be born again? I hope everybody can raise their hand and say, I know what that means. You know, I'm done, I've kind of concluded, or I don't any more talk uh, to people in the jail about, you know, do you believe in God? Because the reality is most people believe in God. But believing in God doesn't necessarily mean that you're born again. I always ask the question, have you been born again? And then I explain to them what it looks like uh, to be born again. Because we see here in Revelation 20 uh, that whenever the books are open and the book of life is open, uh, that if your name's not recorded in the book of life, it says that you're going to be cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. And so it's a sobering uh, thing to kind of think about as we think about this this idea of hell. I want to kind of wrap fire, go down through... Uh, maybe like four, ver- four sections of verses. And I want us to see how Jesus describes hell. Matthew 25, verse 41 is the first one. It says, Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. According to Ma- Matthew 25, 41, why, why is that so sobering? Why, is that, why should that grab our attention? Is that Trace? I, I probably should have recognized my wife's voice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what she said is true. That's, that's the reason why I included this verse on this uh, paper this morning as I'm looking at it, uh, is because the, the, de- the hell or the lake of fire was never designed for human beings, was never designed for humans. And like what Trey said there, that whenever God created this place called hell, um, he, he, he initially did it for those th- that uh, followed the devil, the, the angels, the, ba- the bad angels that followed the devil out of rebel- being rebellious towards God. And so that's a sobering perception if we think about it, that hell was actually designed for the, uh, for the devil and his demons. Revelation 14 and verse 11 says this, says the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. Now he's talking about um, people in Revelation 14 that are going to take the mark of the beast. They're going to follow after the mark of the beast and the false prophet. So that's who, who he's talking about here. But it will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. We, so we see here that it lasts forever and ever. You know, when I talk to folks about hell, then there's a lot of things that we can get in the Bible that describes what hell's going to be like for us. The one, the one thing that bothers me the most is the idea that it's forever. We don't have any concept of what that looks like. We don't have any, any idea what, what is eternal life, what is being forever uh, in hell. I mean, but we, we should look at the positive side of that as well as because the opposite side of that is that when we go to heaven and to be with the Lord, that's also forever. But as I was thinking about this section uh, in Revelation 14, um, my service in the military came to mind as I was thinking about that. Um, I, I got orders along. I'm trying to think, when did I go to Korea Trace? Was I like... 94, 94, 94, when actually Caleb was just born, and I got orders to go to South Korea for a year. They called it a hardship tour. And so the reason why they called it a hardship tour uh, was because uh, it, if, you got, if you guys know the history of South Korea and North Korea, they're still somewhat at a, at a war. They've just decided not to fight each other right now. So it's a different type of environment that you have to serve in. Uh, you always got to be ready if you get called up whenever you're, when you're over there. So they only they limit it to a year, year's time. And the reason why they do that is because it, it would be difficult for people to, to spend maybe two or three years there uh, in, just in the condition of the work that we uh, had to do when we was over there. Uh, but the one thing that always stood out to me, the one thing that motivated me and gave me encouragement is the fact that in one year, in 365 days, this crazy assignment that I'm on is going to be over. And I'm going to go back and home, and, and that's what happened. I spent a year there and went back home. When you think about what Revelation 14 says there in verse 11, that hell is forever and ever. Do you guys ever think about that? 
I'm going to be honest with you. I thought about hell, the topic of hell, the topic of destruction. Uh, but the reality is, as we were reading those things and got questions, uh, ministries, we have to have a combination of the both. Why is it important uh, when you're witnessing to let people know about hell? Phil says it's part of the truth. John? I've heard people say that, you know, God, that peop, uh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. People send, kind of send themselves in the hair, it's to hell. There is some truth in that. Um, that, that, you know, that hell, you know, hell is a place that uh, is, I would call it maybe like the, def- the default location. Whenever somebody is born and as they begin to grow, their de- the default location is hell. Everybody's headed towards hell until we come into a right relationship, kind of like what John said, uh, with Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important. In Mark chapter 9, verse 44, another place that describes uh, this place called hell, it says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What do you think of when you think of a place where the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched? When you think about that, you know, um, I think it's the word, ge- ge- you spell it G E H E N N E, Gehenna. Uh, it's one of the words that we get in the Bible uh, for hell. It was actually a place called Mount Hinnon that was outside of Jerusalem that was kind of like Jerusalem's garbage dump. It was kind of like their landfill, and, and whatever trash that they, they had would be thrown in there. But also, as I was doing some reading about this place, it says that, that uh, uh, corpses, dead people would be thrown in there, and the corpses of animals would be thrown in there. And there was a fire that was always burning in this trash dump. And the, the, the maggots and the worms and all that nasty stuff that happens whenever you've got rotting corpses. I'm just trying to be, I guess, blunt with you guys this morning. Um, that the worms would constantly eat and be there. And so Jesus, uh, we see here in this section, uh, talks about that. Talks about uh, where the worm doesn't die, where the fire is not quenched, where it's lasting forever and ever. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, 6-9 through nine says this, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of, Je- of the Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of of his power. Another place is in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 20 or verse 30. It says, and the, they cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so we see here that hell is a crazy place. You know, hell is a place that none of us want to go. And, but it also should be a place that that we get motivated in sharing the gospel. I know whenever I'm with Mike and we talk, I talk to Mike a good bit, one of the, um, one of the ministries that Mike likes to do is evangelism. He likes to take the gospel. I mean, why do you, why do, you do that? Well, I mean, you, other people could do it. Why do you do it? I think um, uh, what Mike has to say, you know, is we want we want we don't want people to go to hell. Um, who here, who here can think of somebody in your family, be it your mom and dad or brother and sister, aunt and uncle, some cousins maybe, grandparents? How, who here knows somebody in your family that you would probably say that's not saved? You're just, they're probably not saved. Who has? Does, that, does anybody who, raise your hand? I just want to see your hands. That you know somebody in your family that does not know the Lord. Think about that. You know, as I was writing down um, some verses here in Luke chapter 19, and starting in verse 41, it says this. Now as he, he's talking, they're talking about Jesus here. Now as he draw, drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, you especially in this, your day, the things that make 
uh, for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground, uh, and they will not leave in, in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And what Jesus is talking about there is, as he it says, as he moves into Jerusalem, the thing that stands out to me the most in that section is that he wept over Jerusalem. What was Jesus crying about? What, what, why was he weeping over Jerusalem? Mike says they didn't recognize him as Lord. Think about that. The people that I asked you to think about, the ones that you, you would say probably uh, is not saved, ask yourself the question, when was the last time you wept over them? Knowing what their destruction is going to be like. You know, I'll be honest with you, there's sometimes, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I want to pray for people, but I've had people come to me and say, hey, can you pray for so-and-so just for their salvation? And there's no, it doesn't seem like there's any concern on their, on their side about this person's condition. You know, they, you think that they would, they would be moved by it. Um, Charles Spurgeon one time said, and I want to quote him uh, this morning, uh, Charles Spurgeon said, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. What was Spurgeon saying? What was Spurgeon saying? Yeah, Myron, I mean, that's exactly right. What, what, he, what he said, he said, we need to make every effort to reach them. You know, the reason why, I don't know if this is the reason why I've decided to put this morning's message together, but I've lost two brothers in the time of about a year. My two oldest brothers had passed away in, in about, about a year ago, both of them. And the reality is, as my mom and I were talking, my mom, my mom has been a believer for over 60 years. She's a, she's a strong believer. Um, and she was even questioning their eternal state. And the reality is, is that I had to come to grips with the, the idea that my two older brothers are, are probably in this place that we've talked about this morning, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there's outer darkness, where the worm doesn't die. It goes on for everlasting and everlasting. The fire and the, and the brimstone burns constantly with, that, with eterni in eternality uh, in their midst. I had two brothers, and I had to, and, I, and Tracy knows, you know, as I was going back to be with my family, I, I, I have a sister and two other brothers that my sister's a believer, but my other two brothers I don't know about. Why, don't, why do you think that I don't share with them the gospel? Why do you th why, or why don't you share the gospel? What, what gets in the way? And actually, I think I, I would, would add to what Brittany said. She's got a brother. <clears throat> who, who here knows it's hard to witness Christ? It's hard to, to share the gospel with people that you're closest with. I don't know why it's like that. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers this morning through this message or as I'm thinking about this idea of hell, this, about hell being an eternal place where people go, because the reality is, you know, do I believe in hell? based on the things that I do or the things that I say or how my heart is towards those that do not know the Lord, how my heart is towards my other two brothers and my sister, I believe, who is a believer, but mostly to my other two brothers, um, that, that, I, that I honestly believe that. Or do I not believe in hell? Do I have any concern for them? You know, when I pray for them, is it, you know, am I looking like Jesus did there in Luke chapter 19 where he wept over Jerusalem, that he had a heart for Jerusalem, he had compassion for Jerusalem because he knew that of their, of their rejection of Christ, the death and hardship was coming their way in, in, in the manner of about 40 years. Uh, we know when the, when the general Titus came into Jerusalem, he, he besieged the city. He killed almost the majority of the people there, and he, and he ransacked everything, just as Jesus predicted here in Luke chapter 19. That's the reason why 
he wept. And the question we can ask ourselves is, do we weep over our lost, one, our lost loved ones or do we weep over our friends? And so what should our reaction be? What should, how should we respond to this? And as I was thinking about that question, what, what, what should we do? Two places in Romans came to my mind. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what Paul has to say as he writes in this letter. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. If that would save them. What did Paul just say? Mike said that the, he was willing to trade places. I mean, if that's what, that's what I heard when I read that in Romans 9, that he, was willing, that he would be willing to trade places with him. And that's a question that we can ask ourselves because the Bible says that we're to, to imitate Paul. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So we should be looking to Paul as an example as, of someone that we could live to be like. Um, and, and we see here um, that he had a bitter sorrow and unending grief. Why do you think he had bitter sorrow and unending grief when he was thinking about his fellow, the fellow Jews, his fellow br- brethren? Because Paul knew where they were headed. He knew that default location, as I said, the place where they're going to go. And so what basically he says there, what we just kind of, we picked, we picked up on, is that Paul basically said, I would be willing to give up my seat in heaven if my brothers would come to faith in Christ. I mean, and that really, to me, it speaks of, you know, the, the love and concern that he has for them. You know, the question we can ask ourselves is, would I, would, would I be able to say that? I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I don't think I would be able to. Because I, I know folks, you know, when I go into the jail, like every single day I'm con- I am confronted with people that don't know the Lord. And it's like, you know, what level, what, what should I do? Because as I was thinking about this message, is like, um, what should I do, uh, you know, with them? Should, do, I, do I just kind of try to be friendly and just try to become, become friends with them and talk to them and never get to the place where I simply tell them the truth? One of the studies that I had here probably a few weeks back, it, it was the ladies' block, because the ladies' block is always good. They're, they're always very receptive to the things that are is said. Um, but I had a girl in there that said that she was a practicing lesbian. And she wanted to know if that was okay kind of a lifestyle to live. What do you think I told her? She was looking for the question, and I had a room full of ladies that was looking for the answer that I was going to give. And Mike said 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It talks about in that section that these are, these are the people that won't inherit the kingdom of God. It talks about homosexuals. I told her the truth. I told her the truth. I told her that if you, if you maintain this lifestyle, it's evidence that you don't know the Lord. And she said, well, you know, I grew up in church. I, I was around church a little bit when I was growing up, and that doesn't count. <laughs> it matters on how you live your life. Do you have that born-again experience uh, in your life? And so we're talking about, you know, how we are to respond to the unbelieving world. What, the thing that we see there in Romans chapter 9 is that the, Paul had a heart for the people that, that he was taking the gospel to, that he loved them, he had compassion towards them, that he would, basically like I said, that he would give up his spot in heaven so they might be saved. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. And so basically what he says there is that, that once again, he says, I want Israel to be saved. He has a longing for them to come to know Jesus. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 23, Jude says, He says, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with caution, hating the sins that contaminate 
their lives. So how are we to respond? We're to look for opportunities to get, to get into people's lives and ask them questions and see who, what, they, what they believe and what they believe about Jesus and present the gospel to them. And I'm going to bring this to a close with Romans chapter 6. At the beginning of this message, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, matter of fact, as you, as you go down through the Romans road, you start with 3.23, then you go to 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, if we just stayed there this morning, that's bad news. For the wages of sin is death. That if you're a sinner, if you're, if you're living a lifestyle that's contrary to the things that God has to say, that you're en route to hell. But the, the, the second part of that verse says this, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gospel message that we have to tell, tell people. That's, that's, we have to get them out of that default location of, of them heading towards hell as we give them the gospel. Their mind is veiled, the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians. Their mind is veiled. It's not until they get the glory, glorious message of Jesus Christ, the gospel message, into their souls, into their being, that will change their, their lives. And so that's why it's so important for us uh, to talk about um, the truth with people. Like, I, like that girl asked me the question, am I, where am I going? Am I going to heaven or hell because of my lifestyle? I had to be honest with her. and It, was, it, it, was, it really gripped me when I had to say it. I said, you're most likely not going to heaven. Because, I mean, this is, this is a lifestyle that you, you choose to, to be in. And she says, I do. I choose this lifestyle. This is what I enjoy. That's what I want to do. And so I just told her, I, I had to tell her the truth. I couldn't sugar-coated. I couldn't make it sound different so it would be more palatable to her. Um, I had to tell her the truth. This is, way, this is what was going to happen. And if you don't change you know, your, your ideas and your things about the Lord and, and allow the Lord to change your thoughts on this and straighten your life out, this is where you're going to end up. And so I had to give her the truth. And we all probably are confronted with people almost every day that we have to share the truth with. And so next Sunday, I want to talk a little bit about the gospel. I want to talk about the good news. But, but before we close this morning... I want to do this. I, as I was preparing this message, I, I felt like the Lord, i be careful with this, <laughs> it comes out right. I felt like the Lord told me to continue with this message because there's somebody there that doesn't know Christ. There's somebody in this room that doesn't know Christ. I know most of your guys' stories. I, I, I am convinced that most of you that I know, your story is that you guys are born again believers. But here's the reality. We can talk about heaven and hell and the gospel and Jesus and all that, church and God and, and whatever. But if you have not become born again, you're not going to see eternal life. And the question, like that girl said, whenever I asked the question to the girls, I said, hey, who here has been born again? And, and the majority of them kept their hand down. They they didn't know they, were, they didn't know what it meant, meant to be born again. And to be born again simply means that you, you have a life with Jesus. He's given you new life. Um, you, you'll have different... Uh, my mom often always says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you're in Christ, the old things are gone, the new things have come. You'll have a, new, a different way of thinking. You'll have a different way of acting, a different way of doing things. That's what it means to be born again. It's not perfect. I'm not calling anybody to live a perfect life. But that's kind of like what your life looks like. And so what I'd like to do this morning is just ask you guys if you could kind of lower your heads and close your eyes. And I'd ask you to pray for whoever this might be. I don't, I don't know who it is. If you're sitting here this morning, listening to this message, listening to how horrible hell is going to be, for the majority of people, actually the Bible talks about but there will be many on that day that's going to say to me, Lord, Lord, and did we cast out demons and did mighty wonders and did all this stuff in your name? And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, you who work evil. I've never known you. If you're sitting here this morning and you have not can't gave your life to Christ, that you're not, if, if you was to be asked the question, am I born again, you would have to be honest with yourself and say probably not. Not the way that he's talking about. I'm probably not saved. If that's you this morning, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Is anybody in this, in this room, if you, if you were asked about salvation, that you probably would have to say, if I died this afternoon, I would end up in hell.
Well, I trust that all of us, as I'm looking out among you guys, no one has raised their hands. I trust that, that everyone in this room has been born again. If you, if you, you didn't uh, raise your hand because of, out of fear or out of whatever, um, I would encourage you to, to find somebody and talk to them and ask them questions. Find me. I would love to talk to you and uh, answer questions that you might have in, about your relationship with the Lord. Um, with that being said, let's close uh, in a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to be with us as we head out of here. Father, we ask you, Lord, to be with us. Lord, we ask that you would show us the things, Lord, that we need to know every day as we're being uh, ambassadors for Christ, Lord God, that you would give us the words to say. Lord, I know many times I find myself always asking you, Lord, give me the words to say. Give me something to share with somebody that might kindle something within them, Lord. I, as I think about the, the topic of hell, Lord, it's sobering. I, I believe that's what you meant it to be. Um, you meant it to be sobering to us, Lord, that we would take things seriously. Lord, I pray for each person here this morning. Lord, as we leave out of here, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you'd give us a heart for the lost. Also, Lord, give us a heart for that one person that we thought about, that one family member, that one close friend that doesn't know you, Lord. Give me a heart for them. Let me have the same kind of heart that Paul had toward his Jewish brethren, that he was willing to say, I would give up my place in heaven if they would be saved. Lord, give us that kind of a heart. Give us that kind of uh, of, of a way of believing and acting, Father, that would motivate us maybe this week to share the gospel with somebody that they might come to know you, Christ, and be saved. Father, we ask that you be with Steve and Lori as we pray that uh, they're on vacation, they're taking a time to relax. We pray that, 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 Lord, that they would be able to recuperate and come back rejuvenated. Father, we pray that you be with them. And once again, I also pray for Mary Lou, who's struggling with this new diagnosis of having cancer, that you would touch her body, Father, and bring peace and hope there, Lord, for her. Now go before us, Lord, as we leave out of here. I pray that you'd be with us. Help us to be good ambassadors for Christ. Lord, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.